Good evening. Good evening, everybody. May I please ask that you silence your cell phones and other electronic devices, but I do encourage you to tweet, and the hashtag is It's Your World. I'm Skip Rutherford, and on behalf of the Clinton Foundation, Clinton School, and AT&T, we welcome you to the Frank and Kula Compuris Distinguished Lecture Series, and welcome to the 1,000th Clinton School program. <laughs> Under the outstanding leadership of Nikolai de Pippa, who runs <laughs> who runs the best college and community speaker series in the country. And thank you to our many volunteers who help support our students and the Clinton Center programs. We're pleased to welcome our new Clinton School students to their first Compurist Lecture. And we welcome a group of student leaders from Lyon College, whom I had the pleasure of visiting with earlier this week. Bruce Lindsay, Stephanie Street, Lena Moore, and others with the Clinton Foundation are with us tonight as is Terry Garner, director of the Clinton Presidential Library. We're pleased that Dr. Michael Moore, vice president of academics for the University of Arkansas System, is here and he is heading up the Innovative Eversity Distance Learning Initiative. Clinton School is working with Eversity as we explore a new online executive master of public service degree. And I'm also pleased to welcome our 2015 scholar in residence, Dr. Ghazi Zanelli, who is here from Albania and who has enriched us with his talent and his presence and his expertise. And a very special Arkansas homecoming greeting to our good friend, Joy Sakubin, who is working with Chelsea in New York. Senator David Pryor began this speaker series on September the 18th, 2004, featuring Senator Bob Dole. And exactly 11 years later, we are pleased to welcome Chelsea Clinton. In 2006, Dean, Drew, and Catherine Ann began the Compurious Lecture Series in honor of their mother and in memory of their father. And for that, we are all grateful. What a gift it is for our students and what a gift it is for Arkansas. Tonight is the 20th and also the most attended Compurist lecture. But, but sadly, it is the first without Kula Compuris, who graced us with class and dignity before her death this past summer. Please join me now for a short Compuris lecture pictorial tribute as we remember this very special woman.
Thank you. Chelsea Clinton was born in Little Rock. When she was in elementary school, she played third base for her team in the Hillcrest Softball League with her parents and grandparents cheering her from the stands. Like her mother and her father, Chelsea was and is very much a part of our lives. Moving to Washington when her dad was elected President of the United States, she has become in her own right one of the nation's strongest voices for women and girls and a powerful advocate for civil rights, equal rights, and human rights. She received her bachelor's degree from Stanford, master's degrees from the University of Oxford in Columbia, and a doctorate in philosophy from Oxford. She and her husband, Mark, are the proud parents of a young daughter, Charlotte. Her book, It's Your World, Get Informed, Get Inspired, and Get Going, was released just this week. She will speak about it for a few minutes, and her remarks will be followed by a conversation with Stephanie Street, the executive director of the Clinton Foundation. And at the conclusion of the program, Chelsea will be signing books. Now please welcome, back home to Arkansas, the 1,000th Clinton School speaker, Chelsea Clinton. excited to be back in Arkansas, um, to be home in Little Rock. Thank you, Skip, for that introduction. Um, I am deeply honored to be the 20th speaker in the Compurus Lecture Series and to be the 1,000th public speaker affiliated with the Clinton School of Public Service. Um, and I have to say I'm quite pleased that more people came to see me than came to see my parents. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Um, we are a fiercely competitive family. Um, that's probably no great surprise. Uh, thank you to the Compuris family for um, bringing so many people uh, to speak in Arkansas. I think so many for the first time and for giving me an excuse to come back. Thank you to AT&T for supporting this program. Um, thank you to Stephanie Street and her amazing team um, at the Clinton Presidential Center. Um, and to Bruce Lindsay, who's the chair of the Clinton Foundation. It is just such a joy uh, to have brought joy back <laughs> and to be with so many familiar faces. As you heard in the introduction, um, I wrote It's Your World, and it came out only a few days ago. Um, and I had the great privilege um, and sort of adventure of returning back to Horse Man um, earlier today, which was a junior high when I attended and now is a middle school. Um, and talking with the students and hearing from the students really validated why I wrote this book. And so I thought I would spend a little bit of time um, talking about why I wrote It's Your World, um, explain a little bit about uh, kind of what's in it, and then I'm looking forward to talking to Stephanie um, with whatever questions she might have, and then if we have any time left over, because I see kids in the audience, hopefully we can have some time for some of the kids to ask questions since the book is targeted to 10 to 14 year olds. But since you heard from Skip that I was in the Hillcrest Softball League, um, I thought that this might be a good place to start. Um, my parents uh, gave me many gifts. One of the greatest gifts they gave me was a real curiosity and a sense of responsibility to make whatever difference I could make in the world. Um, the first thing I remember reading is the newspaper. I got asked today by a reporter um, from the Democrat Gazette, whether it was the Democrat or the Gazette, I assured him it was both. Um, and reading the newspapers was, was such an important part of my day because it was fundamentally empowering. It meant I didn't have to rely on my parents to tell me what was happening in Little Rock or around the world. I could inform myself, I could start conversations on the way to softball games or on the way home from softball games or on the way to school or ballet or on the way home or at lunch after church on Sunday because my parents were always talking about the world and they expected me to be informed, they expected me to have an opinion, they expected me to be able to make an argument about why I thought my opinion 
was right about why I wanted to see some change happen, whether it be in my school or in the world writ large. So I loved reading the newspapers. I also admittedly loved reading books. And when I was 10 or 11, I read a book that had a profound impact on me called 50 Simple Things Kids Can Do to Save the Earth. And it had such a big impact on me because it treated me seriously. It didn't talk down to me. It didn't patronize me as a kid. It treated me as if I were someone who could make a serious impact in our world. And it informed me with what was happening regarding climate change and pollution. And it equipped me as a little girl in Arkansas with real practical suggestions of what I could do to make a difference in the world. And so I started following what the book suggested. With a group of students and a couple teachers at my elementary school, Booker, we started a recycling program. I obsessively cut up the plastic rings on six pan packs of soda. Yes, some of you may have done the same thing or had kids in your life who did the same thing. Some of the ones I cut up, I glued onto construction paper and I would walk around our neighborhood or I would kind of walk around the church or I would walk around my grandparents' neighborhood and hand them out hoping that if I showed how easy it was to help ensure that a bird or a fish on the Gulf Coast in Louisiana or Mississippi wasn't going to choke on a plastic soda ring, hopefully others would do the same. And that sense of activism was a real gift from my parents, that getting informed was important, but trying to make a difference in the world really mattered. I also learned that from my grandmother, whom I know some of you knew. She moved to Arkansas when I was seven, um, so the same year that that softball picture was taken. And she was such an important part of my life, for many reasons but most of all because she embodied her adage that life is not about what happens to you, it's about what you do with what happens to you. This was taken almost 90 years ago. She was a child classically and tragically of the Depression. Her parents had abandoned her twice before the age of eight. They shipped her out to California to live with her grandparents. Her grandparents, as soon as she was 14, told her, you're an adult, you have to support yourself. And so she had to get a job working as a maid in someone else's home. Thankfully, her employer still supported her desire to go to school. So she would wake up in the morning, do half her chores, go to school, come home, and do the second half of her chores. She was so determined to have an education. And although she'd had no model in her life of what a warm, loving, supportive family looked and felt like, she imagined that she could create that home and environment for her children, and she did. So although she was born before women had the right to vote in our country, she lived long enough to vote for her daughter for president. And that is a remarkable story to me, not only about our country, but about one woman's determination to create a different life for her future than what she'd experienced in her past. And so that her granddaughter was always aware that lots of kids across the world didn't even have schools to go to, couldn't have had the same opportunities that she did to both go to school and go to work. And so not only was reading the newspaper and reading books part of my consciousness as a kid, so was listening to my grandmother and realizing how lucky and fortunate I was. So as I was thinking about becoming a mom, and thinking about kids, and talking about and talking to, maybe I'll just stand right here, because if I move, <laughs> weird sounds happen. So talking to my nieces and nephews, we have 19 nieces and nephews, because my husband has 10 brothers and sisters. Um, so talking to my nieces and nephews and other kids that we knew, I realized lots of kids have that same curiosity. Lots of kids have that same sense of responsibility. And I think kids in general, are more perceptive to what's happening in the world around them than often adults think they are. And so I wrote It's Your World because it's what I fundamentally believe. As much as the world is about those of us that are older, it's more about young people because they're gonna live in it for longer, and I think young people really understand that. And so I wrote it not only to talk about some of the big issues in the world, but also to help elevate and celebrate some young people who are doing amazing things to help their families and their communities be healthier, to be safer, to be more equitable. 
um, to help our world be safer, more equitable, and more sustainable. And so I want to tell you about a few of them, and then if Stephanie or some of the kids have questions about more of them, I'm happy to share more stories as well. So this is Haley. Haley's from Arizona. Um, when she was seven, her dad was diagnosed with diabetes for many of the same reasons that my grandfather um, was diagnosed with diabetes. He didn't eat very well, he was overweight, he didn't exercise, and yet Haley knew that if her dad could eat better and yes, exercise a little bit more, he had the chance of controlling and even reversing his diabetes. And so she told her parents, remember she's only seven, she told her parents she wanted to cook. She wanted to learn how to make healthy meals and help her dad be healthier. So her parents said, okay, if you can figure out how to do that in a way that's safe for a seven-year-old, and you can figure out how to do that in a way that works within our family budget, you can be the family cook. So she started cooking and she realized she loved it and that her dad loved eating what she made. And so she started helping other kids she knew become cooks for their family. And then she started an online kids cookbook. And then she got hired by Hyatt Hotels to completely reshape their kids' menu in hotels across the country. So that's a remarkable story to me for a few reasons. Not only because Haley here is now 14 um, and on the Rachel Ray show and teaching Rachel Ray a little something about cooking, but because it says to me, we often don't know where we're going to wind up. We just have to start. And Haley has helped her father reverse his diabetes, but she's probably helped a lot of other kids have the same impact on their families. So I'm a big fan of Haley's, and I am so proud and grateful to be able to share her story in It's Your World. I feel, oh yeah, please, give Haley a round of applause. This is Alex. Alex is from Southern California. When Alex was six, he realized when he would finish building a Lego set, he always had leftover Legos. And he realized if he always had leftover Legos, probably other kids had leftover Lego bricks too. And around the same time, he realized that not everyone had a home. Not everyone was as fortunate as he was to have a roof over his head or to have toys to play with. He realized, at least as he tells the story, he knew that he couldn't solve homelessness at six, but he thought that he could really make a difference. And he thought that every kid, anywhere and everywhere, had a right to play and had a right to creativity and to imagination. And so he put together his extra Legos and those he collected from others into whole Lego sets and he started donating them to local shelters. Now Alex is 13 and he has collected literally thousands and thousands of Legos from kids across the country and has donated them thousands and thousands of Legos and hundreds and hundreds of complete Lego sets to shelters across Southern California and the United States. And he's encouraging other kids to do the same with whatever their favorite toys or books are. And that to me is also pretty remarkable, that he figured out how to solve a problem that no one else had ever thought of, that he knew he couldn't solve a big problem that he really cared about, but that he could solve problems that were important, that were about kids' dignity and about kids' minds and opportunity. And now he's working to encourage and inspire other kids to do the same. One of, oh please, yes. And this is Celia with an elephant. Um, I'm not sure why I included the parentheses. It's pretty obvious it's an elephant. Um, Celia is 14 and she lives in Hong Kong. And she became aware of this, that since 1980 we've lost more than two thirds of Africa's elephant population. And that largely that's due to a rising demand of ivory, particularly in Hong Kong and China. And so she set about trying to educate consumers in Hong Kong and China that as beautiful as an ivory bracelet may be or as fun as it might be to play with an ivory domino set, ivory is much more beautiful on an elephant and fun for that elephant. And that there's no safe way to harvest ivory. The only way to extract ivory is to kill an elephant. So she kept advocating and writing public officials and starting social media campaigns and she recruited her friends, but she couldn't really break through. She couldn't get the publicity that she knew she needed to really tell consumers in Hong Kong and China, ivory doesn't regrow, which is what people largely thought. And oh, by the way, it's not just about elephants. 
It's really about the African environment stability, and it's really about the economic stability and future of these countries because of the number of jobs that depend on protecting and preserving elephants and on the tourist industry that is largely linked to the iconic animals of the African savannas like elephants. But trying to explain all of that and trying to get people to pay attention to a 14-year-old was really hard. So she thought, you know what, I need a celebrity. And not only any celebrity, I need Yao Ming, the former NBA superstar who is one of the most famous people in China. So she started this effort to recruit Yao Ming, and she succeeded. And so now, Yao Ming is the most famous anti-ivory and anti-poaching face in China. And he might have found this on his own, but I think it's pretty fair to say that Celia had a lot to do with it. And Yao Ming is changing public perceptions about ivory in China and Hong Kong. And that's hugely important, because right now, ivory is as expensive as gold. So it's really lucrative for poachers to kill an elephant and take the ivory to sell in markets in Asia. And so helping it depreciate in value, because people will find other kind of fun and beautiful products, has to be part of the solution. And Yao Ming and Celia are working toward that. And that's pretty amazing. And so I wrote It's Your World because I didn't want everyone to think it was only kind of my passion to engage from a young age, but so many kids' passion to engage and that so many kids are already engaging. I recognize I'm a little bit biased um, because I wrote President Reagan when I was five. Um, and here's a copy of the letter. Please forgive the spelling errors. Um, I wrote President Reagan when I was five because I learned from reading the newspaper that he was planning to visit Bitburg Cemetery when he went on a state to visit to Germany. And I didn't think an American president should go to a cemetery where Nazis were buried. So I wrote this letter, Dear Mr. President, I have seen the sound of music. But the Nazis don't look like very nice people. Please don't go to their cemetery. Sincerely, Chelsea Clinton. I included um, not only the sticker on the front of the letter, but a whole sheet of stickers, rainbow and heart stickers, as a gesture of goodwill, so that hopefully the president would take me seriously. Um, he still went to the cemetery, but at least I had tried. Because we have an adage in my family that it's always better to get caught trying. And there are so many kids who are already engaged in trying to make a difference with small things that really matter when added up and with big things like changing a whole country's view about elephants and ivory or changing how whole families eat at home and in hotels across the country. So I'm so excited um, to be here in Little Rock to have talked to students today at Horseman and to hear what they're doing to change their environment at school, to change what's happening in their home and in our city. And I just could not be more grateful that all of you came this evening to hear a little bit about what I've been up to since I lived here, um, and that you're even just a little bit interested in It's Your World. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I look forward to continuing the conversation with Stephanie. Where should I sit? Well, Chelsea, welcome back to Little Rock. It's Thank so you. Uh, great having you here. Um, you talked a little bit about your motivation in writing the book. My first question um, really is more about being a mom. I have a really important job at the Clinton Foundation, but my most important job is being a mom to three fabulous daughters. What I'd like to ask you is, how has being a mom, Charlotte's mom, affected how you view the world and your priorities and perspectives? Well, certainly my most important um, role in my life as being Charlotte's mom. Um, and I am so grateful to be her mom. I, I can't even remember what my life was before I was her mom. Um, and I didn't know that I could care more intensely about anything I already cared about until I became a mom. And somehow the space that just expanded in my heart for my daughter and in my head and my soul seems to have created more energy and purposefulness toward what I was already working so hard on. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I think becoming a mother of a daughter has just lent even greater urgency to the work we do at the foundation around the rights and opportunities for women and girls here at home and across the world. Um, because I, I recognize how um, crucial that will be to the world that Charlotte grows up in, kind of how she is perceived, how people treat her, how she is um, kind of given uh, equal opportunity to um, any boys in her class or in her group of friends. And so I just have even more of a motivation um, to just work that much harder uh, while also recognizing that my most important job, as you said, is, is being her mom. Great. We have um, quite a few young people in our audience. It's so great to see so many school kids. There's quite a large group over here as well. Um, my next question um, is about your time growing up in the White House. As a teenager in the White House, you had the extraordinary opportunities, which you always talk about how grateful you were for that opportunity, to really travel and see the world with your mom and dad. Um, in the book, you talk in vivid detail about the first time you went to South Asia with your mom. Will you share with us some of your memories, um, the most poignant moments from that trip with our audience? Sure. I mean, I talked about um, my grandmother earlier and how she um, was so kind of purposeful about ensuring that I knew how lucky I was not only to be my parents' daughter, but how lucky I was to live in the United States and have and had the right to go to school um, and sort of the expectation of, of going to school and that that wasn't true for a lot of kids around the world. Um, I don't think I'd really understood that on an intellectual or even a visceral level until I had the opportunity to travel with my mom to South Asia when I was 15 where I just saw so many kids who weren't in school I mean, of every age. And I saw so many kids who were working, mm. who were begging in the streets, who were working in the fields, who were coming out of what were clearly um, shadow factory environments. And that just illuminated in such a painful way what my grandmother had always um, tried to help me understand, just how lucky I was to live in the United States with the expectation of going to school and with the prohibition, candidly, on, on child labor, um, which didn't help her, but which really came into effect um, after the Depression. And seeing that so painfully and in such kind of unescapable numbers um, in cities and in the countryside, um, and seeing in particular how many girls were already wives um, who were younger than I was at the time when I was 15, seeing girls who were already mothers, who were younger than I was, of multiple children, um, helped me realize that I wanted to try to help solve those challenges and remove some of those barriers when I grew up. And I didn't quite know what that meant at the time, but I knew that that was something I felt deeply connected to. And I think it's interesting, too, and your dad says this a lot, how um, people, their intellectual capacity is equally spread but the opportunity is not there. And so I was really touched about how you talked about, on one hand, there was these magnificent sights, the Taj Mahal and the colors, and like you said, and on the other hand, you see these children in slums and begging, um, just really remarkable and obviously made a huge impression. And, and one of the things that I attempt to do um, in It's Your World is talk about how many different things are interconnected mm -hmm. um, and that sometimes we need laws to change, like child labor being made illegal. And sometimes we need cultural practices to change, um, like just expecting girls to not be married at 12, to empowering girls to be able to grow up to be women to then make our own choices. Um, but we also need um, economies to grow so that countries can invest in building more schools and in hiring and training more teachers. Um, because I think too often, um, we oversimplify things for kids, and I hope that it's not so complicated, but I hope that the ways in which kind of disease and poverty and perceptions around women and girls are all barriers to girls going to school, kind of growing up and being able to define their own dreams um, is something that kids, kids really understand so that they know, well, if I really care about clean water, that's actually helping on girls and women rights, if they really care about clean water, that is really helping fight poverty um, because it's all connected. 
Um, also in the book, you address the issue of homelessness, and we actually have a growing population um, of homeless uh, families right here in central Arkansas, and there's so many great organizations just right here that are doing great work like Our House, who I know you're very familiar with. Can you talk a little bit about the myths and misconceptions of homelessness, especially when you're dealing with kids and with families? And if you can tell us the wonderful story of Jade and the organization that helped her and her family. So I, um, thank you, Stephanie. One of the things I try to do um, in It's Your World is kind of break down what are kind of myths in popular culture, particularly in the United States, um, on many different fronts, um, including on homelessness, where I think kind of we have this view that um, only sort of single men are homeless. Mm -hmm. If you look at kind of, if you Google homelessness, you just see pictures largely of single men as one example. Um, and if you look at sort of social studies textbooks that are at use, at least in New York, that's really what you see kind of as being kind of the image through which the homelessness challenge is explained to students in, in New York public schools. Um, and yet we know tragically so many um, people who are homeless on any given night are families, are children. And we don't have good numbers, but estimates are you know, upwards of a million kids in schools will at least sleep one night not in their home, in a shared home or in a shelter environment. And I think it's important that we understand how traumatic and stressful that is for children and how, of course, that affects how kids are in school. It's not only about what happens outside of school, um, it's also about how what happens outside of school affects them in school. And so I write about that so that I hope kind of kids really understand that. Not to look around the school and try to figure out, you know, you know, who didn't sleep at home last night or who may not have a home, but to be more sensitive that we only know what people choose to share with us. And we all need to have that humility and empathy. Um, and Jade is a remarkable young woman, and her family didn't have a permanent home for months, and it was really starting to affect her academic performance. And she was really stressed out. She wanted to do well in French and math. She wanted to keep up the grades that she'd had. Um, but it was really hard to be able to find a place to do her homework. Um, it was really hard to be able to concentrate on taking a test if she didn't know where she was spending the night or if she was sleeping in different places night after night. Um, and she was connected with an organization, Girls Inc., um, that recognized that helping her, supporting her, and empowering her, um, of course, was about ensuring that she got whatever help she needed in school, but it was also about what happened outside of school. And they helped her family find a stable housing environment. They helped her mother find a job so that she could afford a stable home for Jade. They helped her navigate through the college process. Um, and now she's at Boston University. And she is an advocate for that approach to help other, um, other young people, and particularly young women who are especially vulnerable in those situations. Um, and so um, I, I think Jade is really remarkable. And I loved your story of Alex and donating his Lego bricks, because there's really so much that kids can do. Kids have great ideas. Kids are really smart. And one of the things I love about your book, I read the whole thing. Oh, thank you so much. I funny. read it. And what's so great, and when you all buy the book tonight, and especially for you kids, at the end of each chapter, Chelsea has a sort of a to-do list, a list of places where you can volunteer, a list of concrete things that you can do, of people to contact. So that's a really great resource. Well, and I really, I mean, as I talked about earlier with 50 Simple Things, kids can do to save the earth, it was really important to me um, that there be actions connected to each of the challenges um, and that all those actions are on an equal plane because I think every action matters. So whether it is standing up to a bully in school and creating a safe space for your friends to talk about whatever might be challenging them, whether it is joining a social media campaign signing a petition online, helping to elevate and raise awareness, or whether it is you know, collecting Lego bricks or volunteering at a soup kitchen or volunteering to register homeless people to vote because homeless people still have a right to vote in this country, um, which is not true in every country where you have to have an address to vote. Um, 
there's so many ways for kids to be engaged and involved in whatever it is that kids care about. And oftentimes people ask me, well, what do you think kids should care about? And I say, well, kids already care about whatever they care about. You know, we as adults need to ask kids, like, what do you care about? And then I think it's our responsibility to help kids find ways that make sense for them and their families to engage, to make a productive difference in the world today. And not just tell them they have to wait until they're 18 to vote or wait until they're older um, to have money to contribute, that they can make a difference here and now. Great. You talk quite a bit about education um, throughout your book. Can you tell us a little bit what you remember about your educational experience right here in Little Rock, Arkansas, and maybe share if you had a favorite teacher or two or three? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, mean, I already I gave her a shout out today, but she's pretty remarkable. My first grade teacher, um, Dr. Sadie Mitchell. Oh, yes, hi, Dr. Mitchell. Um, was, uh, was a remarkable teacher. Um, and, um, she was, she was great because she really helped me um, learn how to read um, my first chapter books. So she helped unlock this whole world for me. Um, my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Porter, um, was the first person that I remember who really challenged me to figure out how to think critically. Um, and whether that was in my report on um, Egypt or just kind of learning about American history. Um, I loved my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Kelly, who was the single most glamorous person ever. She would wear these like orange chiffon dresses and <laughs> high heeled purple shoes and she was wicked smart. And that was an important lesson too, to realize like you could be beautiful and really intelligent and nobody should judge you only for the former. Um, and so all of these ways in which I just was so blessed to have tremendous teachers who absolutely taught me scholastic lessons, but taught me so many other life lessons um, as well. The only time I ever cheated was in fifth grade on a spelling test. And I, this is so mortifying. I don't know why I felt like I needed to confess this, but I did <laughs> right here in front of, you know, 2,500 people. Um, and I had gotten a 90 on my spelling test because we self-graded them. And that meant I was going to get a B. And this is so pathetic, but I just had never gotten a B because I just like always worked hard and studied hard and I got an A. Um, and so I erased the answer and corrected the answer. It was encyclopedia. I even remember the word. <laughs> and I went up to hand in my test and the guy standing next to me, Glenn, I still remember his name, Glenn was like looking at me kind of strange and I like immediately burst into tears and confessed what I had done to Mrs. Kelly. <laughs> And Mrs. Kelly, I think, was just so surprised that I, I had ever cheated or that I was crying or like all this was just happening, it was so confusing. And she said, well, you know what you did was wrong, clearly, because you're crying. And I said, absolutely. I said, I'm so sorry, I should have never done that. Um, and she said, you know, do you promise you'll never do it again? And I said, absolutely. And she said, well, I still have to fail you for this test. And I said, I understand. And she said, but if you get an honest A on the rest of the test for the rest of the year, you'll still get an A. Um, but if you don't, like, I'll have to fail you for spelling as a subject. Um, so high reward, high stakes. Um, and I know, like, you're on the edge of your seat, right? I'm oh like, my gosh. Mom, I know, what happened? Yeah. what happened? Did she tell your mom and dad? Um, well, she told me I should tell my parents, and if I didn't, she would, Ooh. which also was really good, right? So I went home, my parents were very disappointed in me. Um, I, I think I got grounded for a week. Um, which meant I like, had to stay in my room all weekend long and do even more chores. Um, and I wound up not getting perfect scores on the rest of my spelling tests. So I got an A minus or a B plus, but I remember it wasn't a perfect day. Um, but I was so proud I'd done the right thing. Mm -hmm. And that was such a better lesson. Sure. And I was so grateful that kind of Glenn looked at me kind of oddly because I don't think Glenn knew what was happening, but I knew I had done something um, I wasn't proud of, and that, and that was also a real lesson, too. Like, if you're not willing to kind of stand up and defend what you've done, it was probably not the right thing. Um, so Mrs. Kelly was a great teacher.
a lot of the book focuses on when, what young people can do, but you also tell a story about never being too old to make a difference. Does anyone out here know what a solar mama is? Have you ever heard that term before? I guess not. So will you tell us what solar mamas do and Absolutely. talk a little bit about the fabulous organization Barefoot College and how they're working to solve the issue of energy poverty in the developing world. And I have to mention that I know Barefoot College, Skip, is one of your great partners where your students uh, work during their uh, practicum projects. But um, if you could tell us what a solar mama so I, is. I love solar mamas, um, partly because I clearly love um, still the memory of, of both my grandmothers, and I talk about both my grandmothers in the book quite a lot. Um, my mother's mother, who you saw the picture of earlier, and then my dad's mother, who was really remarkable, who um, passed away before I got to know her as an adult, but I'm so grateful um, for the time we did have together. Um, so solar mamas are uh, the grandmother solar engineers of, of India, although it's now a program that's spreading across the world, um, and it was, started on the belief that um, grandmothers are often really the matriarchs of their villages, and they're the ones who are best equipped to explain why changes should be made, whatever those changes might be. And so older women are recruited and trained how to create, construct, install, and maintain solar panels. And it's a two-person job, and there have now been hundreds of thousands of families whose homes have been electrified because of the tens of thousands of solar mamas. It's also great because it's a source of employment for the solar mamas, and it's also really important because it not only helps ensure that villagers who otherwise might be skeptical, like why do you want to put this thing on top of my house, listen to the grandmothers, and allow their homes to be solarized and then kind of um, given electricity, but also has completely changed how little girls and little boys view women in these villages because all of a sudden they see engineers as women. And once they see kind of engineers as women and as builders and as kind of people who have really cool jobs in their villages, they start to see women as being kind of possible um, options for any dream. And in the villages where the solar, and I don't quite go into this detail, but in the villages where the solar mamas have worked, more women have been elected to the village councils. More women have become head of schools. And there's a remarkable halo effect um, for the solar mamas who bring light, not just of kind of the electrical variety, but a different type of light to their villages. Well, I knew both of your grandmothers, and I could see them both being solar mamas. Yes, for absolutely. Sure, for sure. Absolutely. Well, why don't we take um, some questions? There's, sure. again, so many young people here on this side, and then I think the Clinton School students over on this side. So why don't we open it up to Please. some questions from the audience? Does anyone, any Clinton School students over here have a question? Or any of the uh, kids. Or any kids, of the Girl Scouts. Anybody, any the Girl Scouts, too, the we're Girl not Scouts stood up. I think the mic is going right over here. Hello, my name is Katherine Baxter. I'm a second year student here at the Clinton School. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Thank you, Katherine. I know you mentioned um, talking about to, to young people about what's important to them and what issues they care about, and that's very much a tenant of what we're taught here at the Clinton School, to work with communities and find out their needs directly from them. So I'm wondering, as you've been going around the country talking with young people, what sort of issues are most like, prevalent in their minds, and what do you think that says about the future of our country and our nation? Um, so this is only day three of <laughs> my book tour. So it's, a, it's a, still a limited um, kind of data set. I talked to lots of kids throughout um, the process of working on the book. Kind of as I was conceptualizing the book and outlining the book and researching the book and then writing the book, and I had lots of different kids weigh in at different points in that whole process because I wanted to make sure that it was in response to what kids care about. And I talked to DoSomething.org, which is the largest kind of online community of 10 to 13 year olds, um, and kind of is a mechanism to really enable the millions of kids that are part of the Do Something network um, to advocate for. Uh, certain issues and also to make change in certain areas that they really care about. Um, 
And what I heard throughout that process, and certainly um, just judging on the questions that I received today while on stage and before and after the event at Man and yesterday in Atlanta and Wednesday in Chicago, um, is that kids care a lot about poverty and homelessness and hunger in our country. Kids care a lot about endangered species and climate change um, around the world. And not surprisingly, um, when I talk about women and girls, because I have been asked almost everywhere, I think, like how does becoming a mom in, impact how you think about these issues or your other work? And I talk about um, how there are 750 million women around the world who were married before the age of 18, and that one out of nine people on Earth who is expected to get married this year will be a girl under 15. That often catalyzes all sorts of other questions about girls and women, and why can't women drive everywhere, and why do women need their husband's permission to open a bank account, or what do you mean girls can't be engineers everywhere? So the questions, um, are clearly based on the challenges they see in their own environment or um, issues they've connected to for whatever reason, particularly around animals or climate change. Um, but often what we talk about in the course of, of the larger conversation um, clearly also often connects with their hearts and minds and prompts and other questions. So I think I'll have a better sense of kind of this moment in time um, at the end of the book tour, but certainly the last couple of years, I think, are reflected in the book. I mean, it's why I, I picked the topics that I did, is because it's what I was hearing from kids that they were concerned about or curious about or both. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, wow, look at all these kids Oh, my over gosh. Here. How about in the front row, in the tie-dye? Oh, that's my daughter. That's oh, that's Caroline. your daughter. Oh, <laughs> Stephanie, I didn't even know that was your daughter. But she just, she leapt right up. How did you get inspired to write the book? How did I get inspired to write the book? because I kept talking to kids like you and like the ones that I was just talking about who were so curious about what was happening in the world and didn't always feel like they um, quite understood what was happening, but they were concerned and they wanted to know kind of whether or not their concerns made sense. They wanted to know what they could do. They wanted to know what other kids were doing. And so um, It's Your World is my effort to put all of that in one place. Thanks, Caroline. <laughs> how, about over, how about one of the Girl Scouts? Yes. Oh, perfect. My name is Madison Fleck. I represent Girl Scout Troop 6572. And we want to know, what's your favorite Girl Scout cookie? What's my favorite Girl Scout cookie? Um, so my grandmother, um, my grandmother Dorothy, who you saw in the picture when she was a little girl, she loved Thin Mints. And, oh, okay, and so clearly also a crowd favorite. And she would um, kind of buy boxes of Thin Mints and, and save them and freeze them. And wow. she, oh yeah, I see lots of heads nodding. And she <laughs> would only allow herself three Thin Mint cookies. She was very disciplined, a day, a day, not like a year, a day, until she ran out of Thin Mints. Um, and so when I was over at her house, I was also allowed three Thin Mint cookies. Um, <laughs> And it, that was just so fun, eating our like, daily diet of three Thin Mint cookies together. Those have to be my favorite. Right? Samoas are pretty tasty, too. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty tasty cookie. Who else? Other questions? Oh, gosh. Yes, in the blue shirt. Hi, I'm Caroline, and I go to the Anthony School. And me and my friend Olivia here had a question. How do we as middle schoolers help spread awareness about the problems in our community and how to help get people excited? Yeah. I think, um, I think what Celia's example really shows um, is that although it took her a long time, once she finally connected with Yao Ming, I think he listened to her because she was a young person. I mean, candidly, I don't think if she'd been older, he would have probably taken her meeting. I think it's important to not underestimate the fact that those of us that are older want to believe in the future and want to support what you're doing and want to support you in figuring out what you're doing. So I think the question for you is just to figure out what you care most about right now um, and then ask us for help to help you figure out how to make the impact that you want to have. 
And whether that's raising awareness or raising funds or collecting donations or standing up to bullying at school, whatever that may be, um, I think once you figure that out, it's up to us to help you make the impact you want to make. Yeah. Another Maybe question side. over here? It's hard no. to see with the light. No? Yes. <laughs> yellow bow. The yellow bow. Yes. Yes. Okay, my name is Erica Grace and Erica Grace Holmes and my Girl Scout troop is 6659 and I have two questions. <laughs> what was your favorite subject in school? All right, that was question one. What's question number two? Question number two is what did you play when you were a little girl? So my favorite um, subject in school changed, admittedly. So when I was elementary school, my favorite subject was science. I loved science. I mean, I, I loved history, and I begrudgingly loved spelling um, after that story. <laughs> but, and, I, and I really, I loved math. Um, but I loved science, and I loved my science reports and projects, and I just, science felt like it was always this magical um, discovery, because I was just learning so much about the world. Um, as I got older, I still loved science and I loved math, but I really came to love history. Um, I think because I loved understanding how people had solved problems in the past. Maybe also connects to why I love science so much, because it was about solving problems, too. Um, and I think the best part about kind of my job with the Clinton Foundation is we think about how to break down big problems in global health or around women and girls into smaller problems that we can solve, hoping that if we knock down enough of the smaller problems, we'll help solve the big problem. So I loved science when I was probably your age, and then as I got older, while I still love science, I really loved history, um, and I wound up majoring in history um, in college. And when I was little, I'm really grateful that my parents believed that physical activity was important, um, and they also believed uh, being healthy was important, so I wasn't allowed to eat sugar cereal when I was little, or to have candy when I was little which at the time drove me nuts, but now as a mother I'm so grateful yes. for, um, <laughs> because I realized that that really worked. So I hope it really worked with Charlotte. It's more challenging with my husband, because he's 10 of 11 kids, so I think by the time his parents got around to him, they were sort of like, oh, just like eat whatever. dinner, whatever. <laughs> um, so we're, wor we're working on his healthy eating habits, um, so hopefully by the time Charlotte's kind of aware of what's happening, we'll be on the healthy eating track as a family. Um, but to your question about playing, I clearly played softball, as you saw. Um, I took ballet really seriously when I was a kid and all the way through high school. I played soccer. Um, I played volleyball for a year at Horseman. Um, I was terrible. Um, oh, Somebody remembers. Oh, I, you did? Oh, it was not a reflection on you, ma'am. It was so not a reflection on you. I mean, I, I was really not good, but I came on time to practice. And I worked really hard, but I was so not good that I just, I don't, I didn't even make the team in eighth grade, so. But I, um, I, I loved, um, I loved sports and I loved playing softball, I loved playing soccer, I loved ballet. I even loved my time on the volleyball team even though I was clearly the worst person on the team. Um, oh yes, it's okay. Um, so I loved sports. What do you, what sports do you play? Volleyball, see? Yeah. It's okay, you're, you're gonna do us proud. They're going to do us proud. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think um, if it's okay, I'm going to ask the last question because um, our time is up. And you've, Chelsea, you've given us so much to think about. And again, I just want to say thank you for the very practical tools and concrete ideas and suggestions that your book um, will allow all of us to really make a difference. But um, if you could leave us with one thought tonight, if you'd like people to leave here with one thought, what would that be? Um, that with a little information and help from adults, kids really can make a difference. And that we really have to start conversations with kids, I believe, by asking them what they care about. Um, because at least the kids that I know are already so aware of what's happening in the world around us. Um, and I think it's up to us to help them realize that they're already able to make a difference and to empower them to make that difference. And ultimately, that's good for all of us not only for the world in the future, but for the world today. Great. Well, please join me in thanking Chelsea for this wonderful program tonight.
like to say again a very, very heartfelt and special thank to the fabulous Compuris uh, family for making this lecture possible, uh, AT&T Arkansas, my wonderful friend and partner Skip Rutherford, the dean of the Clinton School. Um, Chelsea is graciously going to sign books, uh, so we're going to go get prepared for that. And if you will exit to the room to the right, you can get your books there. And uh, thank you again. Enjoy your evening. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.